I just said it to my guest. Let's go live. Welcome to Soar Financially. Thank you so much for joining us for our special live broadcast here with Peter Kraut. He's an accomplished book author and, of course, a renowned silver expert. And we're going to discuss what the metals are doing, in particular silver today. It's going to be the main focus. But, of course, we have to draw a bit of a holistic picture. Why is silver moving? The silver price is up 35% recently massive move for metal or for a precious metal in particular and uh, we can also talk gold maybe a little bit because that that precious metal is up also 25 percent for that barbarous relic it's a massive move it's a live episode today and uh, we want to invite you to ask questions we'll have the live chat going here so please use that please ask your questions I'll see if I can fit the questions in either during the conversation or afterwards. And uh, we'll, we'll get, I try to get to all the questions. We have about 45 minutes to an hour allocated to this conversation. And uh, we want to make it educational, informational for you. So if there's anything you want to ask, please put it in the chat. We do want to hear from you. Also, let us know if you can hear us okay and all that good stuff. And if there are any technical difficulties, of course. Now, Without much further ado, let me introduce Peter Kraut. Peter, it is great to see you. Thank you so much for joining me here on SOAR Financially. Kai, it's my pleasure. Glad to be here with you. And uh, I think we're going to have uh, a fun time. Absolutely. Exciting times in the market. And uh, I forgot to show you, but uh, you're the author of the great silver bowl and uh, I, I have your book here as well. And uh, I have a couple topics I do want to discuss with you because uh, there's so much in here. There's so much we need to discuss, Peter, and uh, so much is relevant today. But uh, let's start with a bit of an overview first. Like silver has moved 35%, but we haven't broken through $30. And uh, let's maybe analyze first the move in silver and why it has moved and why has it moved now. So I think that it's all due to gold or nearly all due to gold. Um, you know, silver has a tendency to lag gold. Gold moves first. It's the king of precious metals. Um Gold's been not just strong, but resiliently strong. And uh, if you look at what's driving gold, uh, there are a few things. I think um, it's going to be, first of all, a lot of central bank buying. 2022 hit an all-time high. 2023 almost matched that all-time high. If you look at the kind of buying that came out of central banks, we're talking about over a 1,000 tons a year, which is close to 25%. So, you know, I like to put it in this uh, in this way. There was one out of every four ounces, nearly one out of every four ounces of gold in the last two years was bought by a central bank. That is just mind blowing when you think of the impact that that has and, and the drive behind it and the reasons behind it. So, Gold's been moving really strongly. Uh, the miners have really started to kick in, uh, but silver has has really started to catch up, and that especially in the last six to seven weeks or so. And I think that people are are realizing part of you know what I talk about in the book, uh, this thing called uh, FOMO that it's a FOMO target. People look at gold; they see at at twenty three, twenty four hundred dollars, um, likely much higher before long, and they think to themselves. I need a piece of that, uh, but one ounce is going to set me back twenty, say twenty four hundred dollars US. What other alternatives do I have? And right now, uh, an ounce of silver is spot price. Let's say um, twenty eight dollars or so. If you're looking at a, uh, a silver maple leaf or a, an American eagle, you're still looking at in US dollars probably somewhere around thirty five, thirty seven, thirty eight dollars. Uh, not cheap, but a lot cheaper than an ounce of gold and great exposure to precious metals and and almost certainly a lot more upside. Oh, absolutely. And we haven't even reached all time highs on the silver price yet. And uh, I, I, I threw in $30 because that seems to be an important wall uh, that silver can't break through just yet. And uh, maybe the move was not violent enough to tear down that wall. Uh, <laughs> explain to us why. Why is $30 so important, Peter? $30 has been, um, I guess, a sort of a technical um, a technical ceiling. If you look back uh, over the last three years, uh, in fact, the, act, the action in 2020 when COVID hit, silver actually dropped initially from about $15 or $16 to about $12 very quickly and then reversed almost immediately. This would have been sort of mid-March of 2020 when the pandemic uh, panic really set in. 
And then it absolutely exploded higher and went from $12 to $30. Uh, so that was 140% return in a matter of five months. And that's been the ceiling so far. So we've consolidated in a range, I'm going to say roughly a range of about 22 to 28 and a broader range of about maybe 18 to 30. Um, so I think if you look back, as I say, on a technical basis, uh, the last few years, $30 has been the high. And um, once we break through that, you know, round numbers tend to be um, psychological barriers as well. And I think that that uh, resistance level will, once we're above that for a few, a few days, maybe a few weeks, and we test that level back down and it holds, that will start to become a new floor. And we're looking at, uh, you know, who knows from that point, because from there, the next targets are much higher and the more obvious psychological uh, ceiling from that point will be fifty dollars. So that's uh, that's another forty percent return right from there. So um, a lot of uh, a lot of good things coming once we break through thirty dollars. That's for sure. Do you see a trigger or a catalyst or something that could push silver above that level? We were close. We were at twenty nine fifty the other day, but it it wasn't enough. Uh, you you brought up the gold silver ratio, of course, which. Uh, I think it's around 82. I might be off by a point or two here, but uh, around 82. So it has come down a little bit, but there's still ways to go. But I'm just looking for that trigger that could set off that final move. It seems like silver is just playing catch up because usually silver also massively outperforms gold. Yes, it's up 35% versus 25% in gold, but that should be more like 75% versus 25%. So why is it still lagging behind and what could be a catalyst that uh, pushes silver higher? Yeah, so, you know, the, the this whole sort of concept that silver outperforms gold uh, is certainly true, and we've seen it historically, repeatedly. That outperformance, that huge outperformance, tends to come later in the, in the bull market. What we're seeing now is a certain amount of catching up, which it certainly has plenty to do. Um, you know, if you look at um, the gold-silver ratio, you're right, uh, that tends to really kick in in terms of effect once you see uh, the ratio drop below 80 and then continue to fall. And so uh, what I think is important to realize is that when we see that happen, uh, then things get really bullish for silver. But I would not count gold out at that point uh, because it actually tends, when, when it's bullish for silver and gold, um, it's just more bullish for silver. It actually tends to be in an environment where both metals are doing well. It's just that silver is actually doing better than gold. Uh, when we're talking about what kind of trigger we could look for, I would actually say that uh, maybe we just need to see gold run a little higher. I mean, we're 2380-ish right now, uh, mid-2300s. I think if you can see gold perhaps touch 2500, that would probably be enough to push silver meaningfully above $30. And then I think that we could, uh, you know, see that continue to run from, from that level considerably higher. How geopolitical are the precious metals right now or the precious metals prices? Like if you were, let, let's, let's assume, and uh, you know, that's wishful thinking. And uh, I, I really hope that happens. Israel and Iran make up uh, and, and that conflict is being put aside. Uh, I think uh, it'll, it'll be a while. It won't happen tomorrow. But uh, do, do you think some of the pressure will be relieved from those, uh, from the higher precious metals prices, gold and silver? Yeah, I mean, that is something that in sort of a near term, sort of a tactical sense, I would expect that to, to be the case. Um, you know, what I've seen historically is absolutely the precious metals do react to geopolitical, you know, uh, events, especially this type. Um, but it is a short lived kind of effect. People will, will rush to the precious metals as a safe haven and then things start to kind of settle unless they're unless they're actually you know con continuing to evolve and get worse and boil over things typically then start to back off in the precious metals they're not sort of long-term supportive drivers they're more sort of reactionary and so that's what i would actually expect to happen in that kind of scenario that, that certainly i hope for as well for things to cool down and for cooler heads to prevail i would expect that premium perhaps there's a certain premium right now in the metals because of that and i would expect that to go away i don't think it's a huge premium um but i would see a little bit of dialing back on that basis but overall supportive uh drivers are you know fundamentally economically inflation wise and so on we can certainly get into all of that um there are 
lots of drivers for both gold and silver. And so, um, you know, geopolitical events aside, uh, I think that uh, we're in a very, very bullish environment for the metals. No, no, I tend to agree there, uh, Peter. I think that uh, the outlook is quite rosy. Uh, but we have to keep in mind, silver has sort of lost its shine a little bit as as a precious metal. It's it's become like I wouldn't say a base metal, like that's a bit far, but uh, it, it's looking that way a bit because the applications, of course, are ever increasing. So, so how much, uh, like, like how do I say that properly? Like. Recession fears, I think, have been holding the silver price back in comparison to the gold price, in my opinion, uh, over recent months until just the breakout now where it's caught up a little bit or where it has caught up. But do you see those recession fears coming back? It seems like the U.S. is getting away with a recession here, um, or at least it, it's not happening tomorrow. Uh, is that re recession priced out of the silver price now? Um, I that's a great question. I think that you know m my personal view is that it's it's still probably too early to count one out completely. Uh, I think that there there is still that kind of risk. Um, you know, uh, we we see the the Fed uh, even talking about delaying potentially uh, raising rates. Uh, this was sort of a, these were the last words that that came from from Powell not too long ago. So um, you know they see risk i think that uh even the fact that they would hold the rates high and hold them higher again a little bit longer could actually be part of what would trigger a recession so i would certainly not count one out completely and uh, i would expect actually that uh, silver would be at least somewhat affected by that you know the numbers are there i've, I've seen the research um there's a, a group called um um, uh, incrementum that does the annual Ingle We Trust report, and they've looked at silver and how it behaves in, I think it was about five periods. Uh, so sort of two periods before, two during, and two after uh, a recession and how silver behaves. And it actually tends to underperform gold before and during a recession, but it outperforms gold on the back end coming out of a recession. Uh, so that is certainly something to look forward to. What I think might temper it this this time around is the huge support that we're seeing for um, all of these these green transition um, drivers. You know, you've got the push towards green energy, uh, solar panels, EVs, uh, wind. All of this is a huge part of that, of course. And silver is indispensable to solar panels. You know. It's just incredible the amount of growth that we've seen in in the in the the manufacturing and in the uh, installation of solar panels. That's about eighty percent controlled by China, um, and and there were just some numbers released actually just yesterday by the Silver Institute, and they show that uh, it's funny how <laughs> when they come out with their their uh, their numbers, they tend to you know be revised and considerably upward. So it's like they're being too conservative. Um, the growth in demand for silver from 2022 to 2023 was 64%. It was off the charts. It was just an incredible number. Today, silver is 20% of all, sorry, I'm gonna re, uh, rephrase that. Solar is 20% of all silver demand, period. Of the entire silver market, 20% of it goes to solar alone, the, the single, uh, largest industrial application. And so, you know, I like to say that um, in the industrial side of silver provides sort of a rising floor under the silver price, and then it becomes the investment side and, and these waves of investment demand that are going to come, and they're going to come in perhaps less predictable fashion, but nonetheless, very strong. And they're going to be the wild card that helps to cause the, these spikes in the silver price. And, and if I can go back to solar for a moment, you know, I, I call it the 800-pound the gorilla in the, uh, in the silver market just because it's become so integral and so important to the silver market in terms of consumption. Um, this is silver that we don't recuperate. Silver, you know, industrial demand growing for silver means that we have less and less access to the silver that we're using in these applications because often it's small enough amounts that don't justify uh, the, the recycling process. So that a lot of that silver ends up in landfills in, in, these, uh, in these applications. And, uh, you know, even if solar were to flatten in terms of, which is not the forecast, not by any means, but even if solar 
panel production were to go flat for the next five years, we'd still require more silver for that application because the technologies are evolving. And these are newer technologies that are requiring actually more silver per, per solar panel. So you're not getting away from needing ever more silver, even in just this one application. No, that application is absolutely massive, Peter. You're absolutely right. A uh, bit, bit of a challenge. I was listening to the news this morning in the car, and uh, they were talking about how Tesla in Germany, uh, I think it was Volkswagen, are laying off people because EV sales are slumping. Right? Uh, there, the adoption rate is coming down because because a lot of people bought EVs because they were heavily subsidized, mm -hmm. uh, especially in Germany. Like that's from, talk from the German perspective now. Um, did you see that uh, as, as a as a danger? Like. Uh, the adoption rate slowing down like everybody's got massive adoption rates and like the evs are, are going to explode i think the, it, the future will be electric i think it's undeniable it is trending that way but the pace of it uh, seems to be slowing down because the governments are not willing to throw more money at it uh, at least right. right now until you know probably next election cycle here in germany but uh we'll, we'll that's a different topic but <laughs> do, do you see that as a risk uh, to the overall like uh, silver thesis i mean I, what I consider it certainly a factor. It's something you'd have to take into account. EVs are not a huge portion of silver demand. Uh, I don't know the numbers off top of my head. If I had to guess, I'd probably say they represent maybe 5%, probably even less of overall demand. So if that were to slow down a little bit, maybe you're going from 5% to 4%. You know, a lot of that could be make up, made up in a flash just from investment demand. Um, and certainly it's being made up from solar demand. You know, here, here's a really good example in terms of solar demand and how that just is on fire. Um, there was a report a few days ago how about how in India they're building the world's largest renewable energy park. It is a solar park and uh, it's going to be the size of Paris. And, it, and it's interesting if you look at uh, just some recent numbers with India, their, their imports of silver for February alone were something like 70 million ounces. And that is two thirds of their entire imports for 2023 took place in one month this year. So, you know, th there's no obvious or, or, or um, certain connection, but it would certainly look like if there are suddenly importing that much silver and they're building out this huge solar park that a lot of it's going to end up there. So as I say, you know, solar is so, so strong in this market, in, in the silver market. Um, some slowdown in EVs, I'm, I'm not sure would even have that all that much impact. It's, it's, it's not worrying me in terms of uh, the silver market. And it's so, it's so undersupplied. There are structural deficits that we've been seeing for the last um, three years. This is going to be the fourth year. The Silver Institute is forecasting to expect structural deficits going on for the next several years. Um, and so, you know, honestly, um, again, a slowdown in EVs, I don't see that really uh, doing much to uh, to the silver market. Oh, interesting. I appreciate you sharing your thoughts there, um, P Peter. Um, you, you talked about the supply side. And uh, of course, in preparation of this conversation, I've, I've looked up what you've been talking about recently. And uh, seems like every YouTube title has included the word silver squeeze. Uh, we do have to talk about that. Like what, which, which one are we in now? Is the silver squeeze 4.0, 5.0? <laughs> I, I lost a bit of track, but uh, what, what does it look like on the supply side? Of course, I'm trying to be a bit funny here, but uh, yeah. what does it look like on the supply side, Peter? For sure. So supply really is tight. Now in, in, in one sense, it's, it's not that there's a shortage. It's that there is a, there is a deficit. So a structural deficit, they're really not the same and, and, and your viewers really should not confuse them. So let's look at it this way. Um, the silver market is about a billion ounces a year in terms of supply. About 80 to 85% of that is mine supply and about 15, say to 20%, give or take, is recycling. However, demand is about 1.2 billion ounces. So there's roughly a 200 million ounce deficit, you know, per year. And so I've been getting this question a lot naturally, and I certainly understand silver investors wondering how and why that's the case, that at least until the last couple of months, the silver price was really not doing all that much. It was, and to be fair, you know, the last three years, even if silver has averaged 23 or $24, that's well above the level that it was 
you know, for the, the prior three or four years where it averaged about 15 or $16. So not all that bad. Still, it looked like there was something hanging over the silver price that was keeping it from rising. And so I myself wondered about that. And I said, you know, let's let me dig into this and see if I can come to some kind of conclusion that makes sense as to, first of all, if there is this structural deficit and the silver price is not moving, someone's getting their silver somewhere. And that's, you know, sort of limiting the upside in the price. So I had this sense that secondary uh, supplies or, or inventories were acting as this temporary, at least, supply to uh, this outsized demands. Again, the demand being larger than combined recycling and mining. So I started looking for charts um, and data on the larger futures exchanges and the silver ETFs. And lo and behold, the Shanghai, the LBMA, and the COMEX have all seen in the last three years, their overall silver inventories drop about 40%. Now that's just overall inventories. If you look at what are called registered inventories, which is the actual silver that's available for delivery, because you can buy a long futures contract and then stand for delivery um, and take the silver in delivery. The, those markets were not really built or uh, meant for that, but, but nonetheless, you can do that. Um, well, that's what it looks like is happening because the registered silver inventories are actually down 70%. And then when you look at the ETFs, um, I, my research has, has been limited mostly more, more particularly to the, S, to the SLV, which is the first and largest silver ETF. Now, that was established in 2006. It's about a $10 billion ETF, and it has hundreds of millions of ounces of silver. So I dug up a chart that goes back to 2006 and compares the silver held by the ETF versus the silver price. And you had two periods. The first was during the financial crisis, 2008, 2009, where you had at least initially a considerable drop in the silver price. Well, interestingly enough, during that period, um, the silver held the number of ounces held by the SLV ETF actually went up. The second period was after silver peaked in 2011 at say $49. And then over the next couple of years, it fell pretty significantly. Well, during that period, you had the, um, the number of ounces held by the SLV ETF moved sideways, essentially sideways. I'm not saying it was flat, but it was a little peak. It came off a little bit, but over that, say, two, two or three year period, it was essentially sideways. You can probably see the chart, I, Peter. I pulled it up of the SLV uh, on the screen here. Yes, exactly. So what happened was um, when you got to 2021 um, and you had, this was post COVID. So you had this, this uh, run up in mid 2020, silver went to $30. And then the, the number of ounces held by SLV actually peaked in, um, I think it was early 2021. And then you had this constant drop in the number of ounces that just fell steadily, steadily, steadily until, until currently. There was never in the almost, I'm going to say, so that's 2006, in the 18-year history of SLV, until the last few years, you never had a period where even if you had a major price correction in, in silver, did you have falling silver inventories in the SLV ETF? In the last three years, you've had that. You've had about a 40% drop in their holdings. And so to wrap it up and tie it with a nice little bow, here's what I think is happening. You've got uh, large industrial consumers mostly going to the futures exchanges, buying long contracts, waiting for them to mature and taking physical silver in delivery. You've got them buying the silver ETFs. Um, and if you own enough of a given ETF, in most cases, you're entitled to convert them for the physical silver that is there to uh, back the ETF, to back those units. So I think that's what's happening with the ETFs is that you've got these large consumers buying that and saying, here are my units. I want the physical silver in return. And so 
as you see these secondary inventories being drawn down, I feel that that is what is meeting the, the structural deficit. And I felt that, you know, given the number of ounces that are still held and the amount that's been drawn down, that we are likely in a period of perhaps 12 to maybe 24 months where, you know, that can go only can go on that much longer. And at some point, um, these these secondary inventories run dry and someone either asks for a delivery on their futures contract and the exchange tells them, sorry, no more silver available for you, um, force majeure or whatever. I'm going to pay you out in cash. And that um, consumer or that that contract holder is going to scream and say, I don't want the cash. I actually need the silver. And that's what, when we're going to hear about it. And that's going to be the spark that will really trigger, um, you know, a potentially huge rally. No, 100%. And uh, we, we've seen that. I think apparently we've come close already uh, to, to, to the COMEX breaking. And uh, I've seen some inventory reports from back in the day. And uh, I've had, we've had a number of interviews and conversations here on the channel, of course, about the, the reserves and the registered and uh, uh, ounces in the COMEX vaults here. Really, really interesting debate. Um, one other part of the supply chain or supply side is, of course, the miners. And uh, we need to talk yeah. about them. Um, let's start high level. Like, what does that look like? Uh, do you see any new ounces coming on stream here? And then we'll talk stocks in a second and how the miners have been behaving uh, chart-wise. Uh, yeah. But let's start with a physical. Sure. So, you know, um, there was an interesting uh, bit of research by Bank of America. They, uh, in, they surveyed the 13 largest primary silver producers. And that's something we need to get back to. So the 13 largest primary silver miners, they were asked where they thought supply was going to be in the next few years. And on average, it was going to be flat, which is actually kind of shocking because the silver prices up from a few years ago when they were a, couple, a year or two ago when they were surveyed. And, um, you know, mine supply peaked in 2016 at 900 million ounces, and we can barely get uh, above 800 million ounces. So, um, <laughs> this is not economics 101. Higher, higher demand is supposed to be met by higher supply. And if it's not, it's supposed to be met at least by higher price to kind of, you know, uh, uh, adjust for uh, that higher demand and, and kind of rein it in. That's not been happening. So you have to ask yourself, what's going on? Well, one of the interesting things about the silver market is that um, only about 30% of silver is coming from primary silver mines. 70% of silver, mined silver, actually comes from mining other metals, gold, copper, lead, and zinc. So if, you know, you've, if the vast majority of your silver comes and depends on mining these other metals, depending on what happens in those markets, you may or may not get more silver coming to market regardless of what's happening with the price the price could explode higher and those miners that mine silver as a byproduct could care less what the silver price is i mean they're happy to accept 50 dollars or 100 dollars for silver but they're not going to try and crank up their output they're going to say you know this is relatively insignificant to me i'm gladly going to take this higher price and thank you very much and i'll continue cranking away and producing the, the regular amount of silver that I'm always producing. It's just not all that material to them. So you've got this oddity in the silver market that really is um, supply is inelastic to price. If price goes up and even demand goes up, supply does not react. So you could have this vicious upward spiral where higher price, uh, you know, uh, and, and higher demand leads to higher price and leads to even higher price because supply is just unable to, to catch up and to meet it. So again, very, very particular. Um, and, and in terms of, you know, sort of new supply coming to market, there are a few projects that I see and hear about, especially sort of on the primary silver side. Uh, not many, we're talking about a very small handful. Uh, they're not for tomorrow either. And, um, these are all often being challenged. And we talked earlier about uh, recession risk, for example. Well, the first metals that are likely to be hit in a recession, I think is fair to say, are base metals. And if base metals account for a big chunk of silver output because it's a byproduct of mining those metals, and if, if those 
mining projects were to be dialed back, you could expect realistically somewhat less silver to come to market from from that kind of mining. So really very, very particular environment really in the uh, in the silver space. Oh, absolutely. It is a definitely an interesting market because, as you said, you can pretty much count on one hand how many mines are going to come online or being restarted. And it, it's it's fairly easy to have an overview. <laughs> exactly. Um, it's a small space. The, what, 100% there, Peter. Let's uh, let, let's look at the, the stocks, though. We have to look at it. And uh, I ranted the other day on Twitter that uh, gold has ran like crazy. But uh, if you only if you would have bought in March, early March, you would be up you know, 25%. But if you would have bought like 12 months ago, you'd barely be breaking even right now. And I'm going to show a chart here real quick. And uh, I prepared the uh, the, SIL, uh, the SIL, of course, Global X Silver Miners is the bigger silver miners in there. But look at that. That's a one year chart. And uh, if you would have bought exactly one year ago, you'd still be down about a percent. Like you'd be flat. You'd be breaking even exactly. right now. But if you throw in some fees and everything, so you're probably down a couple percent, okay? Uh, which is absolutely depressing because we're trading at, what is it, 2840 uh, an, an ounce right now. We've ran 35% and yet the portfolios don't really reflect that. And uh, Peter, we, we have to dig a little deeper here. Why is that? I don't see any euphoria yet. Personally, I'm still, I wouldn't say pessimistic, but cautious about the price movements. And uh, especially looking at my portfolio, it looks very similar, to be honest. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, uh, you know, the miners are barely starting to catch up, even with a massive move that they've had in the last, say, six weeks or so. I mean, some of the names uh, are up 90%, 100%. You've got, uh, I'm going to say the larger producers are up probably somewhere more like 60% since end February. Uh, and I'd say on average, the juniors are probably up about 35%. Uh, you're right, though. If you look back over a year, they're not breaking even. But, you know, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not here to justify it, but silver is a long game and you have to be patient. Silver is... In, in some ways, like Bitcoin or like uranium, it goes through these long periods of just moving sideways, it consolidates, and then it, it absolutely explodes higher. And in the last sort of six to nine months, you've had that in Bitcoin, you've had that in uranium, and that's the kind of action that you get in silver. And when that action comes, it makes up for all the patience that you've had for you know, sometimes years at a time. Um, it makes up for it and then some, because it's a, it's a, considerably smaller space even than gold and you know the the um the equities do not have the capacity to accept uh when you get this this massive inflow of money of buying there's just not the capacity and so these names just they just get bid up so dramatically and so quickly so you know again not to make excuses for the space it is a it is uh, you know, sometimes a challenging space to invest in and you need to have a lot of patience. But as I say, uh, you know, the patience actually pays off uh, and sometimes in very short order. So uh, that's really my advice, anyone who's looking, you know, to, to this space. And despite these run-ups and, and your, your chart of the SIL is, is a perfect example of that. Um, despite these run-ups, uh, you're perhaps, as you say, breaking even over a year. Um, anyone who thinks that the ship has sailed, uh, that's proof of it. It has not yet sailed. You've got you've got time. You can take your time. Uh, if you think this is something uh, an area, and I think that everyone should have at least some exposure to silver. Um, it, it's an area that you still have time to start doing research and uh, and and build positions, gain exposure. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of ga gas left in that tank. No, no, uh, definitely agree there because. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, we got to make some money at some point, right? And uh, <laughs> I've right. been in the industry for 12, no, 15 years now. And I'm still waiting for a proper bull market. So that's right. Uh, let, let's, let's get it going. Um, let's talk about money flows real quick as well, because um, some of our audience members might have seen their little Orin Inc. logo at the top here. That's what I'm logged in here in Google. But uh, we run Orin Inc. We're finance, uh, we track yeah. financings of uh, junior mining and exploration companies up to a billion dollars in size and financings up to $100 million. And uh, Ahead of our interview, I looked up how much we've raised so far this year just for silver, which was only $58.6 million for all the silver companies listed. It's uh, absolutely abysmal out there. Uranium, just in comparison, $171 million, Right? Wow. I think it shows the perfect contrast that when a, a metal gets hot, um, the money flows there. 
silver and gold gold as well don't get me wrong gold as well like not not 58 million the numbers are a bit bigger in the gold space but uh there is no money flowing into the precious metals yet uh looking at the orange index we're actually fairly flat um there's the odd breakout just because of a couple bigger deals but it's flat there's no euphoria and no new money flowing in like what are your thoughts on that and uh, when is that going to change peter so um, I think that's when it's going to change as a matter of price. When you see, uh, you know, us hitting and breaking through psychological barriers in the price. And for me, that's certainly uh, around $30. Obviously, higher is, is going to be even better. But I think that 30 is a big one. It's when you see those kinds of prices and they maintain for a while. That's when the miners, the explorers, they start to to, to, you know, they can be a cynical bunch, uh, and I can't necessarily blame them, but that's when they, when they see those kinds of prices and that those prices are sustained for a reasonable amount of time. And I'm talking about, not that I think silver will go to $30 and stay there. I believe it will continue higher, not necessarily in a straight line, but continue higher. But once you see, let's say 30 as a new base, and that base maintains itself as, as a minimum that becomes very much accepted. And that is the case for, let's say, six months, a year, a year and a half. Then you have the miners themselves start to have more confidence that they can um, count on that price. They can build projects that will be uh, profitable at these higher prices. And you'll also have the financiers that are going to look at this and say, yeah, this makes sense. Silver is now $30. Um, I can expect it to at least hold $30. And these projects start to make sense. So that's when I think the money will start to flow in. Um, you know, there's uh, there are always obviously all kinds of factors, but uh, I think that it, it really is price that's going to drive uh, the effect and, and drive the interest towards the financing and and you're right um it's it's a it's a it's a it's a bit of a a bit of a chicken and egg scenario that's what will make the difference what will drive the price higher could be a number of things you know it could be geopolitical uh there are lots of black swans circling um who knows what it what it will take but it will absolutely come and um you know it's by being in the market that uh you'll at least be positioned and and able to benefit when uh, when that happens no, fantastic. Peter, thanks for clarifying that. And uh, I'm glad you didn't mention like, oh, M&A activity in this space is going to draw so many eyeballs. Well, we've seen Newmont buy Newcrest and uh, nothing's happened. And that was a $20 billion merger, by the way. So exactly. Uh, exactly. And nothing's happened, right? Um, Peter, I'm pretty much out of questions and uh, really want to hand it over to our audience. Uh, I think we've covered pretty much everything on the silver side. The only one like random question while our audience maybe sorts, sorts its thoughts and uh, maybe puts a couple more questions in the chat here um, is like, what's the relevance of the gold silver ratio these days? Like we, I know we briefly touched on it earlier. Um, it's sitting around 82 right now. Is, is there still relevancy? Like, and uh, I think one of our uh, viewers put in, uh, let me see if I can pull it up real quick here. There we go. Historical silver gold ratio was around 15. It's 82 at the moment. The question is like, how relevant is history in that regard? Yeah. I mean, th that's a great point. And, uh, you know, these things evolve over time. And I think that uh, if to, to think that, you know, we should be necessarily sitting somewhere uh, on a more sort of constant basis around 15, I don't think is realistic. If you look at, I think what's more realistic is to look at the last few decades, and that would probably bring us somewhere around maybe 55 or 60 in the ratio. So that's the kind of target I think is a lot more fair to, to, uh, to expect. However, um, you know, when you get into the uh, the more aggressive and the more uh, accelerated and mania phases of these markets, and they will come, uh, we've seen it before, we'll see it again, uh, that's when these uh, targets overshoot. And so I would absolutely expect that the gold-silver ratio will considerably drop below 55 or 60. You know, um, I have a really high target for the silver price in a uh, in a mania phase, uh, which is three hundred dollars. And I used to be a little bit shy about that, and uh, you know, I would always kind of uh, justify it uh, or, or qualify it by saying, you know, I'm not trying to be sensational and all that. 
Uh, and yet I've heard targets that are considerably higher. So I, I feel like I'm sounding conservative these days with, with that kind of target. And then I'm asked, how, how do you get to $300? Uh, well, a couple of ways, uh, you know, again, as I say, and I'm not saying, because there'd be all sorts of problems in, in, in all kinds of ways if silver went to $300. So I'm saying 300 would be uh, an ultimate target. It would happen in the mania phase. It may you know, a blow off top where it goes to this kind of price level and then eventually backs off and, 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 and settles and consolidates considerably lower. But one way that I got there was with the gold silver ratio. So you have to start with assumptions. And my one of my assumptions there, uh, because you have to make two assumptions if you're going to get a price for silver and use the ratio, you have to make an assumption for the gold price and you have to make an assumption for the actual ratio. So my target in this cycle for the gold price is, and I, and I think that's also conservative because I'm hearing much, much higher number these days, uh, would be $5,000 gold. And we're almost halfway there. So I don't think that's unrealistic. And then I took the, the low in the ratio in 1980. So this would be the blow off top, the, the mania phase, the peak. And that reached around 15. So if you take $5,000 gold and you do a 15 to 1 ratio, that's $333 silver. So I said 300, let's round it off. And I don't find that unrealistic. Another way that I would get to $300 silver is I look at around the same time, in fact, in 1980, um, if you look at the price of the average US home uh, to the silver price, well, that reached about 14, let's call it 1500 ounces of silver would buy you the average US home. Today, if you were to reach a uh, a ratio of 1500 ounces of silver you with the, the average us home price is around say five hundred thousand dollars us and so if that ratio were 15 to 1 you'd be again looking at about 333 dollars silver so i said all right once again rounded down 300 dollars. and i mean there are multiple other indicators that i use and i talk about all of those in the book there are even others that i've come across since they always pointed to somewhere around $300. So to me, it was not unrealistic and not unfair. And it was actually a little bit of a sign when I kept seeing around $300, uh, depending on which, you know, all these different indicators, uh, they were all kind of pointing to that level. So I said, all right, that makes, you know, maybe, maybe that's what I need to go with is 300 as, a, as, a, as an ultimate target. So uh, let's see, uh, you know, if we get there, um, again, there will be all kinds of other things to uh, to um, perhaps worry about, but um, you're probably going to be happy you own some silver. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. By uh, $300, I'd be happy, Camper, to be honest. So <laughs> uh, definitely. Um, I'm going to throw in some random questions. They're a bit out of order, which, which is fine. Um, let's start with... I like this one. There we go. What is the factor that is moving up silver the most? I'm curious... Uh, if it's the same thing you said at the beginning of the conversation. Yeah, I mean, I would have to go back to that. You know, um, like I say, uh, gold moves first. Uh, gold has moved for some reasons that seem very re reasonable, very realistic. A lot of central bank buying. Um, and if you ask yourself, why are these central banks buying? I think the overall overarching reason is that when uh, Russia walked into Ukraine, the U.S. decided to weaponize the dollar um, and uh, for freezing Russian treasuries, Russian assets. And the rest of the world looked on and said, uh, you know, uh, I don't want to be next. So um, a lot of central banks around the world decided that they had enough treasuries and that they'd rather have gold. And that explains, I think, in a large way, why the miners, until at least recently, had not moved. Because the central banks, one, ultimately don't really even care about the price because they can print all they need to buy gold. Um, and they're not buyers of equities, for the most part. They're actually buyers of the physical, silver, physical gold. So I think that that is really what explains the resilience. And silver, although... Of course, it has a, a very uh, real monetary aspect to it. It is not uh, mostly money the way gold is. And so I, I can understand why silver would have not followed to the same extent, but is now really starting to follow. Uh, I think that 
part of it is that you you've got the Fed, um, and although they've they're flip flopping almost daily on this, but until you know a couple of months ago, they really started to say, okay, we're not only done raising rates, but you're gonna you can look forward to some rate cuts later this year. And I think that um, sort of the broader investor, the retail investor, has sort of has really started to pick up on this and is seeing that in the last couple of years, two, three years since COVID hit, especially, and we've had such massive money printing that they're most of what they buy has essentially doubled in price. And so they're really feel, feeling it in their, in their uh, pocketbooks and in their pockets. And they're saying, uh, I, I need to buy something that's going to help me hedge against this inflation. Uh, it's not an accident that Costco is selling a hundred to $200 million of gold and silver every, every uh, month. You know, I, I'm a I'm a loyal Costco shopper. I go there every week, Saturday mornings, and I see, you know, the bar of gold that is rising in price. I see the bar of of ten ounce uh, uh, ten ounces of silver rising in price. By the way, they don't take returns on those. So in case anyone's <laughs> thinking it's going back, it's not going back to Costco. You see it cheaper um, somewhere else. We give, we we match. They price do they price match on gold? Uh, and silver? I didn't see that. I didn't see that. <laughs> But so they will not take it back. But of, of all, I mean, this is essentially, you know, kind of like the common man's shopping place. And they're selling out of gold and silver. People are cluing into this. And I think that is just a tremendous signal of what's going on, a tremendous indicator. People are raising, realizing they need to hedge. And um, and that's driving buying. It's It's that simple. Now it's interesting, like because I had that uh, debate on Twitter as well. Like, it was access really an issue, or is it convenience? Um, right. Do people not know where to buy gold, or is it just a convenience factor? It's like, oh, let's just buy seventeen hundred, sorry, twenty four hundred dollars worth of gold right now. Uh, right. Go, going, you know, going through the aisle here <laughs> while I buy, you know, a bunch of bog roll and uh, a big box of cereal, right? Exactly. So, Really, yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Uh, interesting is. comment and interesting to watch. I'm wondering if it's convenience, urgency, or maybe both, right? Exactly. So, um, fantastic. We have a few more questions, Peter. A couple sure. more, uh, unless uh, many more rule in. Uh, uh, da, 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 da. It's interesting. Let's... Uh, da, 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 da. No, we asked that one. Oh, I removed the wrong one. Okay, I'll, I'll start with this one. I'll add the other one back to the start list. But uh, uh, what could be the reason why there's no pullback in gold price? I couldn't fit it in earlier, Peter, but... Uh, he, he's hinting at the role of the Shanghai Gold Exchange, and uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are on that, and uh, maybe yeah. China buying so, precious metals. So I don't, you know, to be fair, I, you know, I'll, I'll I'll give my thoughts. I don't follow gold as closely as I do silver, but um, yeah, I mean, I just think that there's tremendous buying. Uh, I, I read some stat just like a day or two ago where it was, I think it was something like two thirds or or even up to seventy percent of the gold that was flowing out of Switzerland was going into Hong Kong in the last few months. So, I mean, <laughs> China has been a really, really big buyer. Um, there's no question about that. Uh, you know, my comments earlier about um, not wanting to be caught flat footed uh, the way Russia was, uh, China needs to build its gold reserves. It knows that. And if it wants its uh, currency to start to you know, take on importance on, on a global basis, uh, to trade with others and, and avoid the dollar, they know they need more gold for people to have more confidence. I think that you know, um, this is all explaining why gold has been so resilient. And uh, gold flowing into China has a lot to do with it. And so I, I hope that that addresses at least partly uh alan's question fantastic no appreciate that peter thanks for indulging us there um i need to look up that number like how much money how, how many ounces have been flowing to china because it's also interesting because i've been hearing about that saudi arabia is accepting yuan then goes back on the shanghai gold exchange and buys gold with that uh, yuan currency so um really really interesting uh one last question i have for you and it is uh, why is silver not a critical mineral well, that's a great question. Um, you know, it may actually become one because there have been some efforts by, uh, led by uh, the people at uh, First Majestic, uh, and they've gotten a number of uh, silver mining CEOs to sign on to this letter that went to, uh, I believe it's Minister Wilkinson uh, for uh, Resor Natural Resources Canada to uh, consider 
uh, silver to become a critical metal criti or cr critical mineral. And uh, as far as I've heard, the last I've heard, uh, there will be some kind of an update. Uh, I believe it's at the end of May is when we may have news on that to see if um, how it gets treated, if, if uh, they decide to include it or not. I'm certainly watching that very closely. But uh, it's as I say, it's interesting to note that there have been some true concerted efforts. Um, they've presented them with a tremendous case for why silver should be considered a, um, a, a critical metal or critical mineral. Uh, you know, constant structural deficits, not all that much supply actually coming from Canada. Uh, that's a great reason. Um, not even all that much supply coming from the U.S. Uh, we're depending on uh, a lot on places like Mexico, Peru, China, uh, the top three. And if you look at uh, Mexico and Peru in the last, uh, I think it's like 13 or 14 years, their combined silver output is down about 25%. They're at 14 year, uh, they're at levels of 14 years ago. So that has clearly peaked. It's, it's really, really interesting. So if we're going to get more silver, and we certainly need it for all these energy transition applications, it's going to have to come from somewhere. Hopefully, it's coming from places that we consider friendly and that we continue to have access to. But if I go back to what I was explaining earlier about how these secondary inventories are being drained, I think it's a matter of time. It's interesting, there was a, um, a report by TD Bank that said essentially the same thing that I'm saying is that these secondary inventories are being drained. They also looked at the silver ETFs. They also looked at the futures exchanges and they see that these ounces are shrinking and shrinking and their target was the same as mine. It was 12 to 24 months before. I mean, and again, you know, no one's saying with certainty, but that is the sense that these at, at the current pace, um, these inventories continue to be drained. That's about the time frame that we have before the secondary inventories are drained. I, I do want to qualify that too, because this comes up and, and uh, I, yeah, I don't want to be remiss for not mentioning it, but at higher silver prices, you could certainly have all kinds of personal hordes of silver, right? People who own physical silver who would be willing to sell it back into the market. Could that have an impact? Of course. So that may perhaps at higher prices, it would extend these secondary inventories when the silver comes out of the woodwork and makes itself into, uh, you know, uh, makes itself available. But I wouldn't count on it. And and I could see that, um, you know, in that kind of environment where silver as a, is at considerably higher prices, you're going to have a lot of demand potentially for physical silver. And so, you know, these sellers of investment silver, uh, sorry, these, yes, these sellers of, of investment silver may meet uh, very, very anxious buyers for investment silver. So that may change hands at high prices, but it may continue to flow to investment holdings as opposed to going to industry to be consumed. So, um, you know, th these are very tight markets and they look like they're getting tighter. So that that's certainly what uh, what I would take from it. No, no, appreciate that. Thanks for sharing that, Peter. And uh, we, we got a super chat in and uh, really appreciate that metal sayer. And uh, let's get to the question. What gold to silver ratio does Peter consider natural and why? Well, uh, you know, there, there are different ratios you can look at. Uh, and if you say natural, well, uh, if you're talking about natural and nature, uh, natural is about uh, seven to one in terms of how much it's mined versus gold. Uh, 15 or 16 to one is apparently how it's found in nature. And then, um, you know, I look back to what I was saying earlier. And if you look at what, if you consider natural to be where we've been for the last few decades, because it clearly has evolved and it's and it's moved higher. So if you look at the average, let's say, of the last, you know, 30, 40 years, and it's closer to 55 or 60, then maybe that's natural. And if we want to be conservative, let's call a higher ratio um, natural. So, you know, 50 on, on uh, the gold-silver ratio, let's say gold going to, um, you know, $5,000. Gold at 5,000 and a ratio at 50, is still a hundred dollar silver. I'll take that all day long. <laughs> so that's one way to look at it.
No. Fantastic. I really appreciate that, Peter. And uh, I do have one last question to sort of sum up the conversation. And I haven't asked you yet, how should we invest in silver? What are your preferred methods right now? How should we, and uh, again, not investment advice, just a general answer, right. please. Um, let's, uh, like, how, how would we, or how should we invest in silver right now, Peter? So, I mean, uh, I just think that, you know, to take a, a, a bit of a wide approach, People need to know themselves. They need to know their comfort level, their, their risk tolerance. And so I say that because that will dictate how, how you would invest in silver. Perhaps for some people, it's nothing beyond physical silver, which is the least risk you could possibly have. And then for some, it may mean, you know, taking on some a bit higher risk going into the silver equities and even to some of the silver juniors. Now, that being said, even if you invest in some of the larger equities, for example, you don't, you're not necessarily needing to take on outsized risk to have really high potential returns. And in the book, I talk about some really, really good examples. From um, 2000 and uh, I believe it was 2001 or so to 2008, you had a 15 times return in Pan American silver. This is probably the world's largest publicly traded silver producer. Then you had from 2008 to 2011, you had a, I think it was a 17 times return. We're talking about 1,700% return in Wheaton, precious metals. Arguably the world's largest uh, capitalization by, by capitalization, the world's largest silver company. They don't even mine silver, so they're even lower risk. And you got a 17 times return in three years. Um, you know, and then the risk, you, you go up the risk spectrum from there. You have the large producers, you have the mid-sized producers that are growing, you have developers and you have juniors. And so I go back to my first comment, which was you have to know yourself, you have to know your risk tolerance. You know, someone who has medium risk shouldn't necessarily avoid juniors completely, perhaps just allocate less to them and be sure to diversify across a number of names so that, you know, if, if one disappears, it's not going to crash your portfolio. It, you know, if it doesn't represent more than a few percent, maybe two, three, four percent, then, uh, you know, you'll easily make up from that for that from the others. Uh, obviously performing well. So that's really what it comes down to. I think people should also do recognize the opportunity. You know, that's why I wrote the book. The book is the overview of the entire silver opportunity. I call it a generational opportunity in silver. Thanks for that. <laughs> um, and I really, I really cover the whole space. And I'm happy to say that that's the kind of feedback that I'm getting from people that it really gives you an overview of the entire silver uh, opportunity, everything from the history to uh, the macroeconomic uh, perspective, the supply demand, uh, what makes silver move, and then ultimately how to build a silver portfolio and how to sell in the end too, because that's going to be important. But for more sort of real-time um, information and research, I've got my newsletter, which is uh, Silver Stock Investor, which you know people can follow at silverstockinvestor.com. And that um, that really is... Uh, you know, my real-time research, I'm constantly following the market, uh, my thoughts, uh, proprietary research on the market, and covering the entire space, everything from the large, as I say, the physical silver and ETFs all the way down to the juniors. So uh, you know, these are the best ways, I think, to, uh, to gain insight in, in silver and perhaps to uh, decide what kinds of exposure, what kind of exposure you want to take on. No, phenomenal. Peter, you, you took away my last question because I was going to ask you, where can we find more of your work? But uh, you, you gave away that answer. Peter, <laughs> highly appreciative of your time. Uh, it's been an hour now. So uh, really, really appreciate it. I love these live conversations. I love throwing in the questions from the audience. Thank you so much for tuning in. And uh, let me go full screen here real quick. Thank you so much for watching SOAR Financially. If you haven't done so, please hit that like and subscribe button. Let us know how we did in the comments. Any constructive feedback is always welcome. We're producing this content for you. We want to make you better and educated investors. And uh, of course, we don't know it all. And we just want to provide bits and pieces here and there for you to make up your own mind. And uh, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you haven't done so, 
catch uh, Peter's book. Uh, the link is down in the description below to to Amazon as well. Uh, keep in mind that's an affiliate link, so careful with that. And uh, we'll be back with lots more. Lynette Zhang on Sunday and uh, lots more. I've, I've seen the list. I've, I'm doing a few more interviews. Jim Bianco, Dave Collum. Really looking forward to it. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll be back with lots, lots more here on Swerve Financially.